<clears throat> as soon as everybody gets their programs. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the Northport Community United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are always welcome here. And I'm so happy to see some more faces, the Tallmans and Mrs. Shep. So glad you're back. <laughs> and so many other of you that are out there today. If you have not already done so, please take the red attendance books on the end of the pew, sign them, send them down the row for others to sign, and then pass back. And if you have a cell phone, we ask that you please turn it off or turn it on silent. Be sure to check the calendar and the bulletin for meetings and activities this week. Just a reminder that the personnel committee is meeting at 5.30, an hour before council on Tuesday night. Please note that the celebration of life service for Bob Norris is this afternoon at 1 p.m. here at the church. The celebration of life service for Martha Durande is here tomorrow at 1 p.m. I encourage you to read the back cover of your bulletin and see the insert in your bulletin for information on the Christmas fund offering. We will be collecting this special offering for retired ministers next Sunday. Friendly reminder, if you are hospitalized, please ask a family member or a friend to notify the church so we can pray for you or visit as needed. Today is the last chance to order a poinsettia. Forms are in your bulletin. Christmas pies must be ordered by this Friday, December 18th. See the blue form in your bulletin. The UCC Women's Christmas Party is this Wednesday at Arlene Hughes' home. And if you have not already RSVP to Arlene, please uh, do so. And we will be meeting at the church at quarter to 10 because, so that we can carpool because uh, parking is at a premium. Uh, this is the last week for the uh, gifts for the homeless. We are desperately in need of adult underwear and socks. And already delivered our 27 packages to the children of Northport. Uh, does anyone have any announcements? Allie? Good morning. I have two announcements um, for you today. My first announcement is for those that are part of our Christmas little play that we're going to be doing next week. Um, practice will be after um, coffee hour, um, after we have our cookies and um, coffee. And my second announcement is a huge thank you to everyone that supported the youth group um, with our cookie bake sale. We the kids came here at around six o'clock last night, or Friday night, and we baked until probably about one, two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> making over 1,100 cookies. We had, I think it was 10 youth, 10 youth here, um, spend the night, we spent the night and baked and had a lot of fun um, being together and the support that you have given us, we are so blessed and so thankful for it. We have cookies, they're all in the boxes. If you pre-ordered them, they are there. Um, just come see Miss Patty or myself um, to pay for your cookies. We also have a few extra boxes for those that wished you had bought them, but maybe forgot to. We have some extra boxes for you as well. So thank you all, we love you, and thank you. For those of you that do not know Allie, she is our uh, youth leader, and also teaches Sunday school, and she does so much uh, for the church. As her husband, Sean does back in the booth. Um. Good morning. I have three things to say. Number one, I'm not going to be as chipper as uh, Allie is. <laughs> and number two, I noticed, I came to my mind that 
Uh, she worked these kids harder than the Keebler elves do works. <laughs> what I wanted to tell you, though, this morning is the men's breakfast is, it's like a Chinese water torture. It's slowly coming to uh, fruition here. And we're, uh, we've got a, we had, it's going to start next year in January after the New Year's uh, celebration and so forth, the New Year. It's going to be a Monday morning, probably at 8 o'clock, so we don't conflict with the counters who do their work in here. Um, the first one, I believe, will be here, and uh, I'm going to mix up a bunch of pancakes and eggs and waffles and bacon and sausages and <laughs> stuff like that. Fruit. Fruit, yeah. <laughs> Ignore that lady behind the curtain. But it's coming together, and it'll start in January, and Attila's got a speaker all lined up for us. So just to keep you advised of that. Thanks. Any other announcements? Good morning, and how wonderful it is to see all you worshipers here today. My first announcement is there will be a public relations, uh, public relations, pastoral <laughs> relations committee meeting very briefly in the uh, building next door after church. I promise you five minutes. I promise. And I have two little stories to tell you that um, I think brought something to my mind that in four years I hadn't thought of. One is... Um, Sandy and John McCain have allowed me to use their name, and they last week had coffee hour. So they sat up in front, and they said, they're going to sit up in front from now on. They've always sat in back. They've always loved Pastor Attila's sermons, but they said not until they got up front did they really see the glow in his face and the wonderful expressions that he has during his sermons. So that's just for some of you who might like to give up a seat in the back and come forward. Um, the second thing I'd like to uh, share with you is we have some new worshipers in the church, and I've observed that they don't go directly to coffee hour, but always do show up at coffee hour. So I said, where are you guys going, you know, before coffee hour? Well, we like to greet the pastor. Let's think about that. I know I don't do it, and it's something I think maybe would be a good Thing for all of us to have a word with the pastor every week. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Any other announcements? Are there any first time visitors today? Just a moment. We have something for you. <laughs> While we're waiting, you can get all your coins out because we'll be having the uh, noisy coin operation. Okay, over on over here. Would you raise your hand again? They're right next to. Uh, And then on the right-hand side, would you raise your hands again? And good to see you. There's some popcorn in it. We want you to pop back in. Anyone else? Oh. <laughs> Joan Peters says it's good popcorn. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now uh, we will now take up the noisy cone offering for our Turning Point Youth Group's Walk on Water retreat. And so the youth, if you'll hear the put your change as the little jar goes by, we do this once a month for a special projects for the children.
somebody saw you. And now let us be in worship. His only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
John 3, 16, 17, Romans 5, 1. As we gather around the Advent wreath today, we rejoice that Christmas is a time of prayer and of open hearts when we sing songs of joy. Christmas is a time of worship, the moment when the busiest of us pause in wonder. Christmas happens when God comes to us in love through Jesus Christ and fills us with love for all humankind. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. 1 John chapter Four, verses 9 through 11. We light this candle to proclaim the coming of the light of God into the world. For this coming, this light, there is love. Such great love helps us to love God and one another. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you that Jesus showed your love for every person, babies and children, old people and young, sick people and those who were strong, rich people and those who were poor. Come to us in this Advent season and give us love in our hearts for all people. Amen. Thank you. We're going to sing our opening song, which is number 93, Angels We Have Heard on High. But if you noticed, on top of the bulletin, there is a scripture from Job chapter 1. In verse 21, he says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that happens by us singing out loud these words, Angels We Have Heard on High. Let us stand.
thank you, God, that Jesus showed your love for every person, babies and children, old people and young. Come, come to us this Advent season and give us love in our hearts for all people. Amen. may be seated. The Man and the Birds by Paul Harvey. The Christmas story, the God born in a manger and all that, escapes some moderns. Mostly, I think, because they seek complex answers to their questions, and this one is so utterly simple. For the cynics, the skeptics, and the unconvinced, I submit a modern parable. This is about a modern man, one of us. He was not a Scrooge. He was a kind, decent, mostly good man, generous to his family, upright in his dealings with other men. But he did not believe all that incarnation stuff which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just didn't make sense, and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He just could not swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as man. I am truly sorry to distress you, he told his wife, but I am not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he would much rather stay home, but that he would wait up for them. He stayed, they went. Shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier, and then went back to his fireside chair and began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound then another, then another. At first he thought someone must be throwing snowballs against his living room window. When he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled miserably in the snow. They had been caught in the storm and in a desperate search for shelter had tried to fly through his large landscape window. Well, he couldn't let the poor creatures lie there and freeze. He remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter if he could direct the birds into it. He quickly put on his coat, his galoshes, tramped through the deepening snow to the barn. He opened the doors wide and turned on a light. But the birds did not come in. He figured food would entice them in and he hurried back to the house. He fetched breadcrumbs sprinkled them on the snow, making a trail to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs and continued to flop around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them, waving his arms. Instead, they scattered in every direction except into the warm, lighted barn. Then he realized they were afraid of him. To them, he reasoned, I am a stranger, a terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know they can trust me, that I am not trying to hurt them, but to help them. How? Any movie made tighten, uh, tended to frighten them, to confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. If only I could be a bird myself, he thought. 
If only I could be a bird and mingle with them and speak their language and tell them not to be afraid and show them the way to the safe, warm barn. But I'd have to be one of them so they could see and hear and understand. At that moment, the church bells began to ring. The sound reached his ears above the sound of the wind. He stood there listening to the bells, listening to the bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas. And he sank to his knees in the snow. I'm going to ask the children to come forward, and we're going to talk about Christmas a little bit. So let's see if we can maybe just sit in the front row. That would be working well. Let me ask you, when was it the last time that you went out at night or in the evening when it was dark and you looked in the sky and looked at the stars? When did you do that last? Do you remember? 
Yesterday, okay, wow, there were two of them yesterday, okay. So now, have you ever tried counting the stars? There are too many, right? Have you tried? And uh, what was the number you came up with? Do you remember? Uh, okay, well, maybe next year in math, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, when Jesus was born, God put a very special star in the sky and in the east, there were three wise men, they also called them kings, and uh, they studied the stars, and they knew that this one star that was sh shining so brightly was a very special one, and they also knew from writings, from books that they had read, that this star would announce the birth of a very special king. So they packed all their stuff together, and on camelback, they went on a very long journey. It took them several months to get there, and they went to Jerusalem, and there was a king by the name of Herod. And Herod um, was the obvious one to go to because they assumed that in the king's palace a new king was born. So they went to the king, and they said to King Herod, we know that a new king has been born. Do you know what his name is and where he is at. And the king was um, not very happy about the news that a new king had been born. He didn't want anybody else to be king. And so he said, no, I don't know anything about this new king that you're talking about, but when you go and when you find him, I want you to come back and I want you to tell me where he's at. So. Um, the three wise men or the three kings traveled for quite some time and followed the star and the star precisely led them where Jesus was born. And so um, they were so happy that they had finally found this new king and they gave him gifts, very special gifts, sweet smelling gifts, gold, shiny gifts, and they worshiped him. Do you know what worship means? What does the word worship mean? Go ahead. That's right, it means to pray, it means to sing, it means to serve God. Um, and so as they were laying down one night, God sent them a messenger, an angel in a dream. And this, uh, in this dream, they were warned not to go back to King Herod because King Herod didn't want anybody else to be king. And so they, um, God wanted to protect baby Jesus. And so the wise man um, went back another route to where they had come from, but their hearts had changed. So let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord God, we thank you that love has reached down to earth in your son, Jesus, and that we can know him and that you have a plan for each and every one of our lives. And we pray for our children today as they um, are in Sunday school, that you minister to them and speak to them your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being such good listeners. Well, wait, let me get the jar. <laughs> the hat's gone. What happened to the hat? Well, happy birthday. God bless you. And do they have a cake for you in Sunday school? <laughs> Well, if they don't, maybe they will have one next week. Oh, he has the hat, okay. <laughs> I'm like, what happened? <laughs> it's a band, too. Okay, the band will tell us how much it is. Okay, stop. Happy birthday, oh. happy birthday. Here, you want the hat? Who no. No, she doesn't, she doesn't want to have. <laughs> All right. Anybody else celebrating birthdays? Yes, right there in the back. Gosh, where are my assistants when I need them? Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Anybody else? Well, if not, then let's bow our heads and pray for everyone who's celebrating a birthday. Lord God, we thank you that on behalf of those that are celebrating today, we can rejoice with them in this milestone and new year in their lives. And we pray that you bless them, please, Lord, uh, with your love and with your care and with all the provisions that they need for daily life. You are the source of everything that we need.
and we pray that they would taste that and experience that this year in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me give you uh, an update on Ruth Long. She had her third surgery this week, and um, I don't know if her family is here or not. I don't see them. Oh, yes, can you give us an update? Because it was totally dead. And nothing was going to heal it. And, and it took all the tissue inside the womb and outside that was dead. And she now has this kind of vacuum system thing on it where it's draining it and allowing it to get some healing. And um, he was in yesterday and he said that it, it was looking real good. And um, our hope and prayer is that Yes. I thought she was going to, so did she share her food? No. Oh, okay, okay, I thought, I thought. Well, you know what, I tell you what, the hospital will never be the same. Uh, they all love her so much, and. And she's so good to them, too. She, she thanks them for everything they do, and you know, she just brings so pleasure to them. She's really looking forward to getting out of there, and you know, if I could capture her silly cat, I would bring him to see her at Hollywood. Yeah, you know, the other day um, we prayed for Andy, right, yeah. the cat, and uh, I didn't know Oliver's name, but now I do, and so we prayed for the dog too, and I know that having a pet is a big part of our healing, and um, so um, I know she's very joyous when she hears about them, and so. So we give thanks for uh, this uh, third procedure that she had. We pray for um, Cheryl Norris and her family and Dave Durande and his family during this very difficult time. Um, do we have other prayer requests today? Go ahead. Okay, well, Lord God, we thank you for um, just being able to uh, unite together as your family, the family of God, in prayer. And we thank you for Ruth and her progress. And we pray that she would recover quickly from this and that she wouldn't have to be long in rehab, Lord. We pray for that and for the transfer tomorrow from the hospital to the rehab facility. Uh, we pray for Dave and um, his family that you help them, Lord. You are, a, you are everything that we need, and we turn to you and ask on behalf of um, Dave and his family and Cheryl and her family that they would feel your presence and your care and your love and your comfort at this time. And we prayed for the Scott family as well, as we just heard, with that sudden loss, that you would intervene, that you would help, and that you would bring your light into that circumstance the light that shines in every darkness, in Jesus' name, amen. Yes, go ahead.
microphone on, please. Test one, two. Okay, all right, so I can't hear myself, so that's probably just for the better anyhow. Uh, I'm here uh, probably as a miracle, I would like to call it, uh, lighting our love candle today. Pastor, first and foremost, the love you have for our Savior and his Father, I am so grateful for. The very first card I got in the mail was yours. Hmm. And in your letter, you offered something that I very much needed, hope. Hmm. That's good. In front of your church family and from my heart, I thank you for that. A short time ago, I was diagnosed with a disease that uh, wasn't very kind. Uh, it had a high mortality rate. Basically, it's a rare disease of soft skin tissue. It's a cancer. Uh, it's with the DNA, it's, so it's hereditary, and it's within my body even as I stand in front of you now. The uh, rate wasn't too pleasant, like I said, it was rare. Forty people get diagnosed with it on a daily basis, and 15 pass away. Hmm. So that was my reality just a short time ago. The symptoms came quickly, and uh, <laughs> brought a little bit of reality in my life. So the professionals... Lift them up in your prayers as well, because thank God for them. They went through the test, they did their diagnostics, and I got the results just for this last Friday. I was at the Moffitt Cancer Center, and they gave me the indication that the disease that I have is called sarcoma. Um, isn't the worst one. So the worst case, case scenario I've been blessed with. I still have it in me. It could escalate. And so prayers are certainly needed. And I'm, that's why I really wanted to stand here today and let you know that I understand if you all lifted me in prayer recently and last week even, they work. Not only your community here, but elsewhere and other support group committees that I, I member as well. The power of prayer. The power of prayer. That's why we church. To realize and to share the glory of his grace. And I want to thank you all for your prayers. Uh, continued prayers, if you would, and because uh, I'm not out of the woods, but that's okay. I have a promise today, a promise of hope and Christ's love. And I want to thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Jim. Well, Lord God, we give you thanks because we know that you are the source of all uh, strength and all healing and all support that we need. We pray for Chris that he would be healed from this. We know you can do it and give us the faith to believe it. And we just turn to you um, because you have all our answers in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. And I see the Sanfords have a visitor. This is our family pie and this photo line. Uh, hey, you were one of the first people that I met at the church. God bless you. It's so good to have you back. How are you doing? Let's give him a hand. Let's give him a hand. All right. Go ahead. Charlie and Eleanor are celebrating their 70th anniversary this week. Well, Lord God, we thank you for Charlie and Eleanor. We thank you for this wonderful milestone in their lives. And we pray for uh, health, happiness, prosperity, and a long life together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Congratulations. Go ahead, Barbara. I have a neighbor. Uh, when I lived in the condo, uh, I saw her uh, Monday, and she has bladder cancer. And I had to mm. share. What is her name? Betty Lou Corlone. Well, let's pray for Betty. Lord God, we thank you that uh, Barbara is remembering Betty. We pray that you would heal her from this cancer and restore her to good health, and we pray that you help her in the day-to-day -day things of life. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you need help with the day-to-day -day things of life? <laughs> we all do, right? Okay, how many of you have an unspoken request this morning? It's too personal um, for you to mention it out loud, so um, I want uh, you to um, know that God knows, uh, as you've lifted your hand, what that is, and we pray that God would answer those prayers. Now, I have to contradict Cindy. Where is she at? Oh, right there in the back. Well, she said, come and greet the pastor today. Well, today I won't be in the back. <laughs> Sorry. There's always an exception to every rule, right? 
Today I will be in the front and I'm going to uh, pray for people. So if you have a personal prayer request, um, I will be here after the service and I'm here to pray with you today, okay? So we'll do that. Um, and at this time, we bring our tithes and offerings before God. Well, Lord, we look again at that uh, word uh, from the book of Job, blessed be the name of the Lord. And before that can happen in our lives, it has to happen in our hearts and in our minds. And so we, we do, we do bless your name. You're holy. Um, there is none like you. Nothing can be compared to you. And no one can match your power, your strength, your might. Uh, we worship you and we pray that these offerings would be a blessing to many in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read to you from the English Standard Version today, Luke chapter 1. We've been studying Luke chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 46 through um, 66. So 46 through 66 of Luke chapter 1. It's entitled, Mary's Song of Praise, the Magnificat. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the uh, proud 
in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those uh, of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him Zachariah after his father. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote his name as John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came up on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard, from, uh, heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. Lord, we pray that you would give us a childlike faith um, that would see the wonder of what you have done uh, for us, your people, and we are listening in Jesus' name. Amen. So, dear friends, here's a passage that is central to the Christmas story. It is part of the whole picture. And for a few weeks now, we've been studying the life of Elizabeth and Zechariah and how God stepped into their lives. Today, as we look at this great hymn of the church, the Magnificat, uh, we have to realize that it's closely related to Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2. It says, and Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth um, derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. It has been said of revolutionaries of the past that religion is the opiate of the people. But when you look at this text, it has also been said by several scholars that uh, the Magnificat is the most revolutionary document in the world. And it speaks to us to, of uh, at least three revolutions of God that we can talk about this morning and that we have time for. And here they are. The first one is that he scatters the proud. I looked up in the Webster's Dictionary uh, what that what pride is, and it says pride is the quality or state of being proud. And another word is priding, and it's an expression that we can also find in the dictionary, and it actually means to indulge in pride. And pride, if we let it go unchecked, it can literally swallow up a person, sweep over a person, and change them uh, completely right in front of our eyes. In Luke chapter 1, verse 51, and we're going to go th- slowly through some of these verses today, it says, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. So it's a state, pride is a state of mind. It's a condition of our heart. Um, and so when we're talking about this revolution, um, it is really... Um, a revolution of a moral kind. What does it mean? It means Christianity is the death of pride. If the message of the gospel gets a hold of people, it changes and takes pride away and causes it to die within us. And why? Is because in the scriptures we are encouraged to imitate to be imitators of Christ. Um, There is an old book, it's called the Imitatione Christi, to imitate Christ with our lives. And when we do that, it will tear away this stronghold um, of pride. So when we declare peace, speak peace, um, not human-made peace, which, you know, we look around in this world and, you know, we can have peace conference after peace conference, If our peace doesn't find its source in God, it's not going to last. Say, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. Um, Because human effort is not enough to keep peace in this world. 
And you know, when we hear in the Jewish language or in the Hebrew, Hebrew language the word shalom, say shalom. shalom. I'm gonna get you involved this morning. <laughs> and don't think I'm gonna do a 10 minute message either. <laughs> so shalom in the Hebrew is more than a greeting. It means not just peace as a word and not just war as absence in society or war being absent, but this peace, this shalom, is something that the Hebrew person, when they say it, they wish it to people, or they say, this is my prayer for you. I want you to have the shalom, the peace of God, whether you are coming or going, whether you are sleeping or whether you are awake, whether you are working or whether you are just sitting and enjoying the presence of God in your life. That's what they want. And it has nothing to do with the presence of war because you can have the shalom even if there is war. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's the peace of God. It's the peace of God that we're talking about. And it finds its source in God's presence. It, uh, we actually are reminded of it very often in Philippians 4, verse 7, at the end of our service, as we say, and the peace of God, which surpasses, transcends, is bigger than all our understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's you. That's you. God is guarding that peace in the midst of the biggest storm, in the midst of your biggest trial. You can come before God and you can tell him, Lord, I want to keep my peace. Despite of what's going on around me. Now, that's very significant and very different um, from living in this world today. Um, and that the way how the world tells us at times, we have to guard ourselves from it. Because the world will tell you, go ahead and take revenge. And that's what's going to give you peace. And then um, the world will also tell us that the stronger one owns the rights to everything. Matter of fact, I heard somebody teach this morning on this um, where it says that the one in control will be happy, we're so often told. Have you been in control before? We all have. How much happiness has it given you? Zilch. You walk away, and your happiness is not deeper, it's not better, it's not more foundational. So the world tells us, do it this way, and we have to say, no, we have to count God in. We have to consider God. We have to keep him in the picture. We can't afford leaving God out of the equation. And so this moral revolution that the Magnificat is talking about starts in the heart first where God speaks to us, points things out, and then the work can begin. The American writer, O. Henry, um, has a short story in which he tells the events surrounding the life of a boy who was brought up in a little village. And um, he was sitting next to a girl in school, and they were fond of each other. But their paths uh, separated, and he moved into the big city. And there he fell into evil ways. He became a pickpocket and a thief. And one day, as he was snatching the purse of an older lady, um, and he was about to take off with it, he saw that girl walking down the street that he used to sit next to in school. She still had that radiant innocence about her that he had lost a long time ago. And he walked up to this lamppost, and he leaned his head against it, and he said, oh, God, I wish I could die. Why did he say that? Because the Holy Spirit started working in him, right? I'm grateful when the Holy Spirit starts working in us. And I always encourage people, I always say, you know, when you feel God's uh, Spirit taking a hold of you, and let's say you feel, like you're, you feel like you need to shed a tear in church, don't care what the person next to you is thinking about that. Because if you open up your heart, you unlock that lock, of your heart and let the Holy Spirit in. That's part of the revolution, isn't it? That's part when God gets a hold of us and he starts working within us. So um, 
the Word of God and the Holy Spirit places the mirror in front of us where we can recognize ourselves and we can uh, feel the Holy Spirit rising within us and we can see um, the work of God through Christ's Spirit uh, working redemption. So walking with Christ points out pride and it's, the, it's a death blow to our pride. And so that's the revolution number one. The second one is that uh, he will, he brought down the mighty and exalted the humble. Let's look up Luke 152. It says, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. That's the second revolution. Christianity puts an end to the world's labels and prestige. Labels are for food cans, but they're not supposed to be passed on amongst people. But we can't help but be impressed. Some years ago, the Queen of Denmark was coming to visit our institution, the seminary where I studied. And boy, we all went out because the Queen was coming to town. The red carpet was rolled out, we had honor guards, you know, we had an, a reception, and rightfully so, she had a title and it deserved honor. But honor is also something that we first and foremost need to give to God. We honor him first. And when we honor him, we know how to honor each other in the right way. Moretus, a um, uh, writer of the Middle Ages, uh, was a wandering scholar. Uh, he was poor, and in an Italian town, he fell in, ill, and they took him to the local hospital, and the doctors were huddled over him, and they were talking to each other in Latin, not dreaming that the man could understand every word that they were speaking. <laughs> and they said, well, you know what? Um, um, we're going to take this worthless wanderer, and we're going to do medical experiments on him. And he looked up and looked at them, and he said, don't you call anybody worthless for whom Christ died. We do put labels on people, don't we? And we do it unknowingly because we get so used to it. It becomes a way of living. And so um, uh, when we let Christ take hold of us, this work of the Holy Spirit becomes a social uh, revolution within us. It becomes a revolution um, um, that, we call, that we can simply call a Christian revolution. The third one, let's go to Luke 153. Are you still with me? Are you still with me? Yes. Are you still with me? Yes. Oh, good. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Now, does that mean God has something against rich people? No. But he does have something against the fact if we hang our hearts on worldly riches and leave God out of the picture. He does have something against that. If I put my trust into the mighty dollar and not of what God wants to accomplish in our lives. And so when we're talking about this, um, we can say that living God's way in Jesus guards our hearts against being callous and unfeeling. Uh, and there's a mighty love that shines through um, when God's love gets a hold of us. Because then we cannot walk by a homeless person like this one on the picture and say, oh, that's not my business. We can't do that. Because God has made our life his business by coming down to this earth and said, I am claiming you. Isn't that what we do in a family? We claim each other, right? We say, oh, no, that's my family. I claim them. And so we cannot walk by with a callous heart, but this revolution, when it takes a hold of us, uh, makes us feeling and compassionate and kind. And let's go to the next one. When we talk about Christianity or this Christian revolution that I briefly pointed out to you today, it first starts in the individual, that's in you. Then it starts spreading into the community, and then it starts spreading into the world and making a difference. And I, for heaven's sake, just couldn't think of a better example than Mother Teresa. You say Mother Teresa, and everyone knows what she stands for. She was on her way 
uh, in a train to a spiritual retreat when God spoke to her and said, I want you to leave the walls of the prestigious Catholic, um, you know, rich people paid so their kids could go to that school. I want you to leave the safe confinement of those walls and go out into the worst slum and teach people about the love of God. She got no support for it, no financial backing. She sat at the corner of the worst slums in the city where she was at. She took out a broken blackboard with a piece of chalk and started teaching the children of the slums how to write and read. And then, eventually, she was acknowledged. And today, her order is one of the largest in the world helping those that are outcasts of society, whether east or west, north or south. Isn't that amazing what God can do when this revolution gets a hold of one heart of this tiny woman who had no backing whatsoever and was able, in the love of God, to start a social revolution and make a difference in God's name. Let's look up Luke, Luke 1, 46 through 47. Mary's song of praise, the Magnificat, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. So let's read it together, starting with where it's underlined. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Let us stand and pray together. Lord God, <clears throat> this praise goes on from year to year, from generation to generation, from century to century. How many times have people read it in the house of God before? How many times have we prayed over it? How many times have we sung it? We pray that it would take deep roots in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs> And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. Amen.